1944, the German city in which Dietrich Ritschl was living was bombed, and thousands of people were killed. Uh, after the bombing stopped, uh, Dietrich was lying on a bench. He was lying on this bench in the railroad station, and this railroad station was serving as kind of a makeshift hospital. And he was looking up through the partially destroyed roofs and ceilings and seeing all the destruction. And he caught a glimpse of an inscription that was carved into one of the remaining sections that was still intact in the ceiling. The inscription said this, Beyond the stars, there must live a gracious Father. I want to read that to you one more time. Beyond the stars, there must live a gracious Father. Father. You see, lying there looking at that inscription with all the destruction around him and the war and the death that has taken place, he thought to himself, I don't want such a God. I do not want a God who is beyond the stars. I need a God who's here. I need a God who's present, a God who's available, a God who knows and understands my situation, a God I can talk to. You see, let's be honest, if the only God we have is beyond the stars out there somewhere, he's really of no value to us. We, we don't need a God who only dwells beyond the stars. We need a God who dwells with us, who understands what it's like to live as we live. Uh, we need someone who understands our pain and our suffering. We need a God who is near, and that is exactly what we have in Jesus Christ. That's the message of Christmas, that God has come into the midst of our suffering. And I don't know about you, but man, I had some challenges this year. I messed up a lot this year. What was your year like? Did, did you love well? Do your kids love God more now than they did last year? How's your marriage? How are your relationships this year? How do you feel about those right now? What was the lowest point of the year for you? Because what I know for sure is that for some of you, right now is the lowest you've ever felt. You see, everyone else is happy, but not you. Maybe you come to church this morning, or maybe you're forced to come to church this morning because you owed it to a parent or a child, and you see all these people here smiling, and you see these kids up here singing and having a good time, and you see people worshiping, and some people even holding their hand up to worship. And you just don't get it because you couldn't possibly feel any further away from God right now. And let me tell you something, for right now, that's okay because you are not alone. Maybe you just can't seem to get into it this year and maybe it's because the person you did all this with for years is gone and no longer with you. Perhaps you have new struggles in your life that you never had in years past. Maybe you messed up really bad this year and now there is no way you can imagine enjoying Christmas uh, maybe this year hurt you financially, and now Christmas looks just a whole lot different than it has in years past. Whatever it is, maybe Christmas doesn't feel like Christmas for everyone in this room. And if that's you, I just want to say, I am sorry, but you are not alone. You see, alone is not a good feeling. But I want to say these four words to you that I'm going to repeat over and over today. Four words that change everything that are so simple. You are not alone. You're not. You're not alone. You're not abandoned. You haven't been forgotten. I don't know what you've been told. I don't know who has made you to feel like you are alone, but you're not. I know the feelings of loneliness seem so heavy and present at this time. I don't really enjoy Christmas because it was one of the very last times I ever saw my dad alive. I don't really enjoy it because of that. This, this time of the year is low for a lot of people, but I've got good news. You are not alone. I think you would agree with me that what we call Jesus matters. How we describe him really matters. What names we choose to call him are very important. And he has a lot of names in Scripture, all of which are beautiful and have deep meaning. I just want to give you a few that really mean a lot to me. He's the King of Kings. He's a Redeemer. He took my place. When I was the one supposed to die on the cross, he took my place. He redeemed me. He's called the Lord. He's called the cornerstone. When everything else is gone, the cornerstone is there. He's the everlasting Father. 
everlasting father. He's not disappearing. He's not going to go away. There won't be a Christmas where I see him for the very last time. He's the everlasting father. He's the teacher. He teaches us how to navigate this life. He gives us wisdom. He's the master. No one's better than him. He's the lamb of God. He's the sacrifice for me. He's the good shepherd. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the I am. He is Christ. And he has many, many names. But my favorite is the one we're going to talk about for a few moments this morning, the name Emmanuel. Emmanuel. You see, Emmanuel isn't just a name. It's a promise, a promise that no matter what we go through, we're not going through it alone. We've been in a series the last few weeks about the Advent. It's called Advent, and we've been looking at the different things. And as we get to week four of Advent, today's theme is love. And I can think of no greater expression of love than Emmanuel, God with us, God choosing to come down to us. I'm going to read Matthew chapter 18, or Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 again in a few verses, and then I'm going to give you some context to that that I think is going to be helpful. So Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18, says this, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit, and her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, Resolved to divorce her quietly. Man, how different would the Christmas story have been if it ended right there? But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by a prophet, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name. What is it? Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, the word Emmanuel simply is translated to mean God with us. God's with us. He's not far from us. He is with us. He's here today. Emmanuel is a reminder. In fact, Emmanuel might be the greatest reminder that you are not alone. You'll notice that verse 23 in Matthew it's in quotations. It's not an original thought. He's quoting somebody. So he's actually quoting an old prophet from hundreds of years prior. And to fully understand what Matthew is saying here and what we just read, we need to go all the way back to the Old Testament. And so as we go back to the Old Testament, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 7 and read just one verse. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And here's why we're doing this. Because Matthew chapter 1, verse 23 is the fulfillment of of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. So what we just read is the fulfillment of what we're about to read. So Isaiah 7, 14 says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. You see, in Isaiah chapter 7, God's people were being attacked. They were being destroyed by the enemy. God showed up and told their king, the king Ahaz, he said, I'm going to give you a sign of victory. This sign of victory I'm going to give you is that a virgin will have a son, and that will be my sign that shows you, you win and they lose. He's reminding them, I'm going to be with you no matter who is attacking you, no matter what is attacking you. So then, hundreds of years later, Matthew comes along and picks up this quote and shows us that Jesus' birth from the Virgin Mary is the fulfillment of this prophecy. You see, Christ's birth brought the infinite holy God within reach of finite sinful man. God came to live with us so that in the end we could live with him. See, Emmanuel in Isaiah chapter 7 is a sign of God's deliverance from temporary trouble, but the name Emmanuel in Matthew chapter 1 is a sign of God's deliverance from eternal trouble. You see, what we need even more than deliverance from temporary trouble is the sure knowledge that Jesus is our Emmanuel. We need to know that in the worst times or the best of times, we're not alone. Loneliness is a funny thing, and if you're like me, you don't really like to be alone. I don't even like to be alone when good things are happening. I, I have to, every time I preach, I feel like I have to tell a baseball story because I love baseball. Um, and if you know me, I'll, I'm a huge Texas Rangers fan. 
And I also have to apologize for my social media behavior during the World Series because I'm a huge Texas Rangers fan, and I posted all the time about the Texas Rangers. But I actually had the opportunity to go to the World Series this year, and I was given this opportunity. I didn't go, but I had the opportunity. What I did instead was I went to the ALCS game, the, world, the series before the World Series, and I did that because somebody was offering to get us tickets, and they said, hey, I'll get you tickets, and here's the money, just go buy what you want. And I could have gone to the World Series, but I would have had to have gone by myself. So instead, I went to the, thing, the series before and took my wife because she likes the Rangers. And I enjoyed that so much more than doing that by myself because even in good times, you don't like to be alone. You can't describe it. It's not the same trying to tell people about your experience. But the opposite is true as well. You see, during the height of COVID, I had a back surgery that didn't go well. In fact, it became majorly infected, ended up turning into a couple years of major health battles. And at one point, I was flown by helicopter to ICU, um, just to a major hospital. And let me just tell you, ICU hospitals were terrible during COVID. You know this. A lot of you understand this. It was terrible. Uh, they were giving me blood transfusions, removing blood clots from my legs, uh, prepping me for all kinds of tests and procedures. Doctors and nurses were everywhere. Don't get me wrong. There were people in my room. Doctors and nurses were everywhere, constantly watching me. But it was during COVID, so I was not allowed to have guests in my room. And I have, I've had a lot of health issues in my life, but up until that point, my wife has always been there for me. She has been by my side, has driven me to so many hospital visits, been there by my side in the hospital bed many, many times. But during COVID, she wasn't allowed in the room. They would come after surgery and tell me things, and I'm out of it. I can't remember what to pass on to my wife. I was alone, even though people were everywhere. I survived. I made it. But my heart breaks when I think of the people who died in those hospital beds all alone without their person next to them. It's heartbreaking. And some of you experience this with your loved ones. There's a Christmas song called Hark the Herald Angel Sings. You've heard it. You know it. And one of the verses goes like this. And I'm actually going to put the words on the screen for you as well. It says this, Bailed in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. See, the author of this hymn, this song that we sing during Christmas, is a guy by the name of Charles Wesley. He was a famous writer, a famous preacher, and so was his brother, John Wesley, who you may have heard of. Uh, John Wesley, after living a long life serving the Lord, spreading the gospel, he was laying on his deathbed. This man, John, who had helped usher in the Great Awakening, this man was dying, surrounded by people, literally on his death, deathbed, friends and families gathered around. His very last words at 88 years old, he opens up his eyes and he says this, the best of all is God is with us. And then he passed away in his sleep, those being his final words. I want to show you a picture from that, actually. I believe I have that to come up on the screen. So just a few years after his death, the family commissioned a painting for John Wesley. They wanted to remember that moment on his deathbed. And you can see there, people everywhere. But you know what John Wesley wanted them to know? I find it amazing that he is surrounded by people, and all he wanted people to know was that God is with us. We are not alone. You see, throughout history, there have been those who have been killed for their faith, set on fire for being a believer, isolated, sent to prison, beaten, whipped, all for believing in Jesus. And yet, they must have known that they weren't alone. Man, I wonder, as they were being abused and beaten and set on fire, did the promise of Emmanuel help keep them strong? How else do you die for the gospel when you don't know Who's with you? How else do you die for the gospel unless you know that Emmanuel is with you? You see, the book of Matthew begins in that first chapter by telling us that Jesus is Emmanuel. But if you go to the end of the book of Matthew, he ends it by showing us that we are not alone. Matthew 28, verse 20, very last scripture in Matthew says, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He ends the book of Matthew by reminding us that we are not alone. From the first breath to the last, he is with us. He is Emmanuel. I find it interesting that in all of Scripture, 
the name Emmanuel for Jesus is only mentioned three times. But the truth of God with us permeates the scripture from Genesis to Revelations. You see, Adam didn't have to walk alone. Abraham was not abandoned. Joseph wasn't really alone in the pit that his brothers threw him in. God was with Moses when he crossed on dry ground. He was with David as he killed giants. He was with Daniel as he was thrown into the lion's den. He was with the three Hebrew boys as they were cast into the pit of fire. He was with the apostles as they shared the gospel. He was with the early church fathers as they fought for the truth. He has been with missionary after missionary as they have spread the gospel to all parts of the world. And he was with Joseph Damien, who was a missionary to the Hawaiian Islands in 1864. And I want to show you another picture of Joseph coming up right here. This is Joseph Damien. And in 1873, you can see him in the middle there surrounded by children. In 1873, he volunteered to minister at a leper colony where there were no doctors, no nurses, no clergy, not even a grave digger. This specific island was a place of quarantine for people with leprosy. Damon had built a small chapel on the island, but very few people ever came to worship. After 12 long years of unfruitful ministry, Joseph decided to leave in 1885. He felt like he had failed. But he was standing on the pier waiting for his ship to take him home, back to Belgium where he was from. Damien looked down at his hands in that moment and noticed white spots. He had contracted leprosy. The news of the missionary's disease spread quickly throughout the village. Hundreds of lepers gathered outside of Joseph's hut. The people could now identify with his pain and his despair. The following Sunday, that little chapel that Joseph had built was overflowing with people. Over the next four years, before his death, at age 49, Joseph Damien shared Christ's love in a way he never could before the leprosy. Until he became one of them, he wasn't really accepted. And I want to show you one more picture of him just a few days before he died. You can tell the leprosy's already gotten him. What a hero. What a hero. Church, we're not alone. Here's the deal. Jesus knows our struggles. He knows what pain is like, but he's the great physician. He knows what a broken heart is like, and I can't help but think that people have come in here with broken hearts today, but he's the healer. He knows what betrayal feels like. Maybe you felt betrayed this year, and Christmas is different because of that than it's been in years past, but he knows what that's like. He knows what loss is like. You're not alone. He knows what temptation is like, because he was tempted. He knows what pain feels like, because he felt pain. He came to this earth and was one of us. You see, we can condense all the truth of Christmas into three words, God with us. But I'm a realist. I know there are people listening to me who don't know how to begin. I mean, you just feel like you've messed up so bad and you don't even know how you would get back to a place where you have a relationship with God or at church or people here. You may be confused or worried or scared to take that first step towards God, but I am telling you, it will be the greatest thing you ever do. Because aren't you tired of feeling alone, surrounded by people, but feeling alone? Are you tired of pretending like everything is okay? And my guess is that you didn't come to this Christmas service thinking you would finally get right with God. Like, you didn't walk in this door thinking, I'm going so I can get right with God. But I don't think there's a better time to get things right. Maybe your family has been praying for you for a long time, or perhaps your spouse has prayed. Maybe even your parents have prayed for you. And I bet they just want you to know that you don't have to do a life alone, that we do have a Savior. He comes in and he saves the day. If everything is okay, then you don't need a Savior. But if you'd look at your life and you'd say, no, everything is not okay, you'd realize you do need a Savior. Let's just be real, strip back any facade, and realize that perhaps not everything is okay, and you do need to embrace Jesus I don't know how bad you've messed up. I don't know. I don't know what you've done. Maybe it's been a great year. Maybe you're here and you're wondering if you could ever get right with God again. You can, and I promise. I've got four children, and I may have even shared this story here before. You might have heard it, and if so, I'm sorry, but you're about to hear it again. I've got four children, and they are different age range. They're starting to get older now, but when they were younger, any of you remember the bedtime process with toddlers? 
exhausting, isn't it? Terrible. And you're learning it. You're, you go in there and you put them to bed. Five minutes later, they run out crying because something's not right in their room. The light was left on. They see shadows. We didn't sing the right song. We didn't read the right book. Over and over again. You've done this probably if you're a parent. You know what this is like. And it's a battle. They're crying. They're screaming. If they're younger, they're little babies. You finally put them in the crib. You think they're asleep. As soon as you walk out, they start screaming again. These little toddlers, right? The audacity. You know what happens, though? The next morning after that battle, after that fight, after they messed up, the next morning, they come running into our room as if nothing even happened. The audacity, right? They run in there like, what? It's a new morning. And it is. And I think that's how God wants us to run to him this morning. Run to him as if nothing even happened happened, and I promise he's there for you, he's waiting, and he will accept you. I'll never forget the kids running into my room with those smiles, and the scripture says that God's mercies are new every morning. And this morning, he has new mercies ready for you, ready for you to come embrace them. And I just want you to know, church, to run to Jesus with zero shame, zero regrets, run to him, and I promise he's not going to reject you. He is with us and you're not alone. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads just for a moment? And being alone is tough. And I see so many people here today, and as I look into your eyes and your faces, I just can't help think that it was a tough year for a lot of people probably. And I don't know what you brought into this room today, but I'm hoping today that you can leave it here. I'm hoping today that you'll give it to Jesus. That's what I've been praying for. You know, a lot of people in this room have been praying that today would be the day that things change. Today would be the day that you realize you're not alone. I'm going to pray for us in just a moment, but before I do that, I want to invite you to begin a relationship with Jesus for the very first time. Maybe you're here today and this is all like new to you. You've not talked about Jesus. You've not heard much about this. And today you said, no, I do think I need Jesus because he is a savior and I have messed up and I need Emmanuel. Today's the day. Run to him. So I'm going to pray and then invite you to stand, and as you stand, maybe you need to come down here and pray, find someone else to pray with, do business with the Lord, because I just want to remind you today, you're not alone, and you don't have to stay alone. If you leave here today and you're still alone, I'm sorry, but we tried to offer the message of Jesus to you. You are not alone. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you that you sent Jesus, Emmanuel, to be with us. Thank you that we are not alone. Through the worst moments of my life, I've never been abandoned by you. God, I pray that if anybody in here today has never never received you as Savior, has never admitted their need for you, have never believed, never confessed with their mouth, God, I pray today's the day. God, give boldness and courage to those who need it. God, if apologies need to happen, give us the boldness and courage to do that today. We thank you for Christmas. We thank you for Emmanuel. Thank you for the promise that we are not alone. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen. Would you stand very quietly? And we're not even going to have the band come up. We're just going to give a couple of moments for you to respond, to pray, to do whatever it is you feel God leading you to do. In fact, what we're going to do is just let the, let the music play for a minute. As you stand, maybe just close your eyes, bow your heads. Do work with the Lord. What a great December 24th, Christmas Eve. What a day to say that's the day things changed for me. Today's the day. Let's take just a couple of moments. Bow your eyes. Bow your heads, close your eyes, and let's do work with the Lord.